How's it going, everybody? My name is Christopher, this is Leighton, and this is the Ustazen Show. Today, we're talking about territorial behavior. What is it? How can it occur? And what are the signs and how can you stop it? But first, a few words from our sponsors. So obviously, our main sponsor is Partners Dog Training. Uh, we run this from the Partners uh, Training Facility here in Cape Creek, Arizona. It's great to have you guys with us. If you want to do some dog training, we're the place to come. Uh, we're doing this for about 20 years at this location, even longer than that uh, if you count the others. And during a time, we trained about 32,000 dogs. So I'm sure we've seen your kind of dog as well. Yeah, we specialize in behavioral training and actual uh, actuality. Um, we just launched a thing. Wow, I can't speak today at all in the slightest. Uh, been we a long just day. launched. Yeah, it has been a long day. We were expanding a, a bunch of the things at the school, so just been been working on doing that, expanding the daycare out, which should be really exciting. And, Four a.m. Uh, starts. Yep. Yep. yep, and two o'clock in the morning finishes. So um, definitely, you know, excited to to talk about territorial behavior with you guys today. Before we get into that, we have a program online called Hey Ludwig, where it's basically our way of trying to give access to our training, our experience, our passion for dogs, and helping pet parents have a beautiful relationship with their dogs. It's our way of expanding that out to basically every single dog um, in the planet is really the is really the goal. So giving them access to both credible as well as adaptable education that they can use for their dog. Um, right now, there's things like pulling, jumping, you know, behavior fixes in there. You can learn obedience. You can learn tricks, all the things down the line. It works through Facebook Messenger. It's called Hey Ludwig. If you look online on Facebook Messenger, type H-E-Y-L-U-D-W-I-G, then you can start training right away. And uh, with that, let's get into, into the show today. So we're talking about territorial behavior. Now, what is territorial behavior? So... Territorial behavior is actually a lot more common than what people realize. Basically, it's when you have a dog that reacts to somebody coming closer to them, coming into the room, coming in, to, you know, up to your car. Um, you have a dog that's maybe sitting in the back of the car, and the moment somebody approaches, the dog goes crazy and barks like crazy. Um, it's actually quite common, as I said. So, you know, a lot of times people don't understand what they're really dealing with, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And I've actually we've got a little special guest. You might have seen me looking down in my lap a second ago. So, our little guest here tonight is Coco. Coco is my daughter's dog. There she is. Yeah, it's um, actually his dog. He says it's his daughter's dog, but it's his dog. Well, you know, I, I got to put on that, that uh, tough image, you know, tough guy image. Um, but the reason why I've got Coco here tonight is because you guys can see she's, the, she's a little sweetheart. She loves a lot of attention. She'll sit and cuddle with me, you know, on the odd occasion that I get to play with her. But this little thing can be as territorial as, as anything. If she is lying on my daughter's bed, and uh, sleeping at nighttime and you walk in there wake her up she growls she gets corrected for that um, you know we, we're working hard on on uh, on obviously fixing that and that's something that i wanted to mention tonight when we talk about this territorial issue is that it's a step-by-step -step process she's learning to you know focus on other things what we do is we try and redirect her into other stuff not just you know want to beat up on the dog um, obviously she's a tiny little dog you know, it doesn't take much to correct her, um, but she learns and she gets better and so forth at it. And we use obedience and you can see she's, she's really good. She loves having a face touch and so forth. But, um, you know, I wouldn't approach somebody who's holding a dog like this. A lot of times if a dog is like this, like if you put your hand over her head, say hi to her. Yeah, she probably won't do it with She's me. really mellow right now. I'm actually looking at the camera to see how she reacts uh, because I can see more in the camera. But this little thing can light up the place. And uh, I've often yeah. pointed out when uh, when somebody approaches us, she's the first one to wake all the big dogs up now what's your opinion on it, it feels like smaller dogs usually are more territorial and then become submissive when you do like confront that territorial yeah. behavior. yeah there, there's a lot of theories about that um you know i could probably talk for an hour on that subject alone but just in a nutshell the the majority of little dogs are really kind of encouraged into that you know they get carried around a lot they get pampered a lot they get given privilege they're always up on the couch they're always up in people's beds and that gives them a stature always or a held. yeah always being held so she's lying in my in my arm right now licking my hand being really cute and so forth and you know this makes them feel like they're in a higher level than what they really are um it's interesting because when my other big dogs are around they don't pay any attention to her at all they'll literally run right through her right over her uh, she has to learn to kind of like step aside at the door etc etc um, but, you know, again, we're talking about territorial behavior tonight, so I want to uh, kind of bring it back to that. It's that this little dog can be territorial, but it's really just a show that she's putting on for us. Now, what, what do you think about 
when parents say, because we always get this at, at snake avoidance training because we see so many dogs in such a short period of time. Um, we get a lot of parents where their dog will start barking as we start to approach and they say, oh, my dog's just protecting me. Yep. So there's a big difference between protecting and being possessive or territorial. Um, the best way to kind of explain that, I always use the example of if you and your significant other go to a restaurant, you're sitting having a meal, and let's just say it's like somebody walks up and, and says hi to Sarah, that's fine. But if they say, oh, she looks cute tonight, and I jump up all with an attitude and everything, that's not being protective, that's being more possessive. In other words, it's almost a, a insecure type behavior. And a lot of territorial behavior is insecurity-based. So... Um, you know, when people say my dog's protecting me, unless there's an absolute threat, or unless, you know, somebody's well, saying something. most of the time, unless they've been trained. Because in, in yeah. most, like 99% of cases, a despite what every pet parent will say, um, if your dog is faced with that confrontation and they haven't been trained to protect you, um, then they're probably not going to protect you. Right. And then we've you've done a, a video on the news which got a, a bunch of publicity probably wow. 15 years ago. Yeah, like um, hundreds of thousands of views and a whole bunch of comments yeah. from experts. Yeah. And, and that, experts. Was, that, that was 15 years ago, which is a lot for, for back then, but yeah. it's still a lot today. But um, So that show was, was about, is your dog going to protect your home? And so it yeah. was basically going and testing this theory and of that my really dog is, is protecting. And that really territorial type behavior. Right. Those dogs were mostly territorial. They didn't really know how to protect the home. They just the made bark. noise. And some of them yeah. didn't even make a noise. In the one dog's case, I walked right into the house, walked around the house. I actually picked the dog up and carried the dog around with me. And this was a dog that everybody thought was going to protect the house and attack me. Very mm -hmm. few dogs actually will protect per se unless they're trained to do that. And something else to remember is that a correctly trained protection dog is also not going to indiscriminately bite anybody. Well, it's they, got a lot of courage and, yeah, and it's, it's they're especially tested in for special that. areas and, and so forth. Like you don't want to... A, definitely you don't want an aggressive dog but you don't want a dog that's insecure or has any type of those um, behaviors in a protection trained dog because that's will just leak out into you know a whole bunch of trouble especially if then your dog goes and bites someone and they say oh well that dog's been trained to bite and so that uh, becomes a whole huge legal issue um, so let's let's talk a little bit about something you just brought up a few minutes ago as well so when you when you have a dog that's territorial you know first of all how do we recognize yeah, the, signs the signs of being territorial uh, let's use an example. If you're in your car, I mentioned this one earlier. If you're in the car and stop at a traffic light and somebody walks up to you or you stop in a parking lot or you drive through a gated community, any of those kinds of situations and your dog just lights a person up on the outside, it's unlikely the dog is being protective. I know a lot of people think it is and I'm sure I'm going to get some comments about this, but protective is when the dog perceives an actual threat. That dog is not recognizing a threat as well at all. Yeah. Um, we've seen it often. Sarah's dog can be mad. He can be really territorial sometimes if he's in the vehicle. And the other day I was wearing a hat, I was working outside and she drove up, stopped alongside me and he just lit me up. And the moment I spoke, he realized it was me and then he backed off. Not because he changed his threat level, he realized he's not going to get away with being territorial with me around. So yep. that's how you can tell one of the differences. Now, just on that point, do you believe that some dogs have just such poor eyesight? That, yeah. Because that's, that's honestly like an argument that I've heard is that, oh, my dog just obviously dogs don't have great senses of sight to be to begin with um and so that can obviously affect you know the way that they respond right. in, in certain situations and so too. it's not just an eyesight thing it's actually a perception thing so it's how your dog recognizes it's kind of like how they they take what they see and connect the dots to analyze what it is that is actually there well, it's like if you've ever walked past your house and past a mirror and all of a sudden you see like something out in the first in, in your perspective and you see a reflection um of yourself you might freak out and, and jump perspective in I, I said in your in your um... <laughs> just messing with you. So so and 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 on that same thing, like if you come home at in uh, you know in the evening or whatever the case is, and your dog sees you and they bark, and you say to him, "Hey, it's me." Don't you realize it's me? And then the dog's like, "Oh, okay, hi, how you doing?" Again, same thing. They see a shape, they see a form, they see yep. some movement, something like that. They think that's a perceived threat or and or uh, territorial thing. She's passed out on my lap. Look at that, <laughs> absolutely passed out. She's got a head her nose muzzled in my hand and that's another thing by the way a lot of times dogs will do that because it's like a comfort zone it's almost like a in effect the same thing that they have with denning with crating mm -hmm. uh, so she's lying you can't see it on the camera unfortunately but she's lying in my lap and she's got her head stuck in my in so, my hand so talking about crating then what because uh, that's a pretty common occurrence when a dog is acting territorial in a crate um now is that over the crate itself or is that the environment around them could it be both could be both, um, you know, and, and this is Especially the same thing. Especially because this is what she does a lot. Because right. you'll walk into the house and she'll start barking. And actually, the 
probably the barking changes from territorial barking to just excited barking. Right, exactly. Um, you can tell because they get like a yippy sound to the voice right. and so on. But you'll see the same thing. Those of you who go to dog parks, and I'm not a big fan of dog parks, but if you go to a dog park, they often have a law that says no leashes on dogs. What they're actually talking about is that the leash actually builds or encourages that sense of being uh, um, territorial. And it kind of feeds back to the owner. So the dog feels more in control and therefore feels more pushy and more dominant with other dogs and so forth. A lot of times, dominance and um, and uh, territorial behavior kind of go hand in hand. Dogs not really being dominant, it's probably more of an insecurity, but the moment they're on a leash and they're being withheld ba- back, held back, um, I saw this the other day with a gentleman that, had a, um, that was working with us uh, that had a dog on a harness. And harnesses for obedience training are... I was going to say a disaster, but there's going to be a bunch of people that won't agree with that. So let me, let me kind of explain what I mean by that. So a harness kind of encourages the dog to drive, to pull, to Well, if you think about it, that's why harnesses forth. were made. Exactly. I mean, when, yep. they, like they were used with horses and, and drawn Correct. carriages and so forth. And it puts the, the center of, of gravity at the dog's strongest point, which is right in front of their chest. So when you use a harness, like almost i would say nine times out of ten when someone says that my dog's pulling or my dog you know doesn't really listen to me i'm like well, what kind of equipment are you using and they're almost always using a harness or some type of similar equipment and i was like well that's your first problem like a your dog needs to respect you a little bit more you need to develop a little bit more of a foundation but b you're using the wrong equipment and i always say like a or you know equipment is basically you trying to jump out of a plane once without a parachute it's easier to do it the second time and so with uh with the right equipment you're able to achieve you know better results more you ever jumped out of a plane with a parachute i have jumped out of a plane with a parachute yep and i can do it a second time because i had the parachute so this story christopher calls me one day he's supposedly (laughs) at college in california on a project and he calls me back one day he says hey dad guess what i just did i'm like what did you just do just just note that i waited until after i had done it before because then at least i was like all right well i survived rather than i i'm about to jump out of a plane so all right you can finish the story he calls me he says i just jumped out of a plane and parachuted i'm like um this is that conversation we have of like when you go out on your own no 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 he said he said no you didn't he didn't you didn't believe me i didn't believe you at first no at first and so i had to take a picture of the plane and the certificate that i got when when I when I j- jumped and uh, had to send that to him because you wouldn't believe me at first. Yeah. Well. And like I said, I so made much sure for to trust. You know, you think you got these kids trained. I don't even think I've ever told. I don't even. I think you I told do, my mom. You do know next. your insurance doesn't pay out if you die jumping out of a plane, right? So I got yeah. nothing to cash in on the money that you owe me. The thing with jumping out of a plane is that it's not scary going up into it. It's like right the very moment where you're on the edge of the plane, and you're like, all right, well, this is the moment where I'm either gonna die or I'm gonna have a good time. Uh, and I think even if you would die, like that's what a good way to go. You know, yeah, that's true. That's true. You have a you have a fun ride towards right. the bottom. So back to so back territorial to behavior. So another sign of territorial behavior that I want to talk about is dogs that lunge at people. And this is something that you've really got to be but got to pay attention to. If you have a dog, if your dog is lunging at somebody mm-hmm. and and really lighting it up, you've definitely got to seek help. That's definitely something we can't address in detail here on the program. And because another reason why like head halters and, t- right, and the right. harnesses and stuff don't work is you could injure the dog that way. And, and something that I, you know, I kind of was reminded the other day, I was watching something at another trainer was talking about and we were talking about liability and that's going to lead me into my next point here. Something we have to remember is that when we're talking about these kinds of things, we're talking very general, very generalized statements. Um, they're always specific. So a lot of times I'll see a dog and the dog will display, you know, minor territorial behavior. And then all of a sudden, they just light us up. And we have to be careful of that. So if you have a situation that may come to that, just be really careful. All right. I wanted to get into... Oh, I said that was going to lead me into one thing. So one of the... Where did I make that note here? One of the things that... Uh, many years ago, I was actually attending a conference in uh, California. And the trainer that was talking was instructing this, this group of us. And he brought up... He said, before you do an evaluation, always do a medical assessment first. And I was like, geez, I've worked with at that point thousands of dogs many years of training and i've never actually done that and and that kind of changed my whole life and when we were making the notes for this program we made that note because a lot of times territorial behavior can be tied together with some kind of a medical issue so it's a really good point when christopher made these notes uh watch out for medical issues if you think or you suspect your dog might have a medical problem go have it checked out uh, make sure that there's nothing underlying going on maybe the dog is in pain um you know sometimes when dogs are uh, in pain in one area, they'll display it. It's kind of like chiropractic. I'm sorry, not chiropractic, acupuncture. What, I think you it know, was when the, you, 
it was a German shepherd that had like just very, very bad, you know, very bad back. Very right. Bad, not Probably DM. Of DM, but yep. and uh, and they said that like literally if you would just try to touch. I feel like it was someone that was on the podcast. I can't remember now, but if you try to touch its back, then it would, you know, go off on you. And it would only do that when you, when you did try to touch its back. Um, and then they went and saw, you know, medical help for that and, and got the dog. Uh, I can't remember what they gave the dog, but some type of surgery. And then after that, then the dog's behavior completely changed. Yeah. So um, it's definitely something you want to check out. Yeah. The other thing that you always want to remember as well is that dogs will often display territorial behavior in certain settings more than they will in other settings. So, for example, if you have a dog that is territorial in its crate, like Christopher was talking about, and you're traveling with your dog and you put the dog in a hotel room, that dog and uh, housekeeper comes in, your dog's in the crate, they will react a different way than what they would otherwise behave uh, just because of the association with that location. It might be that they're perceived to be more of a, uh, I was going to say threat, but it's not a threat, it's more of a stress. So, stresses are a big factor when it comes to territorial behavior. Uh, other dogs in the environment, the types of training you're doing. Yep. Um, you know, I know, for instance, when uh, when we used to do a lot of the uh, uh, bomb searches, it went on for hours and hours and hours. Our dogs would really stress out, and they would become really kind of like, I was going to say chirpy with us, meaning that they'd be like territorial, but it would be more just kind of leave me alone, I need to take a break, etc. And so you have to measure that as well. And those are obviously not genetic per se issues. Those are more of a learned or a... Or a um, environmental type behavior you want to go into some of the body language uh, sure. like territorial so i pulled up a picture here um and and for the people that are listening to us afterwards so we'll kind of describe or you can you can describe like the body language of territorial behavior so when you see this is obviously a border collie and border collies are herding breeds and so when they're herding animals they often use their their pressure to dis to push or to nudge or to move on the animal that they're hurting could be ducks. Most of the times, it's obviously sheep or or uh, cattle. If you look at certain dogs, you know you get a dog that that will display what a behavior will look one way. So this border collie that you're seeing, he's kind of like showing he's a little bit insecure, a little bit fearful. Uh, he's looking up, so he's he's kind of gives you that that look. A lot of dogs we we refer to it as whale eye. This dog's not actually showing whale eye, but they'll show whale eye where the eye actually has a kind of a look of. Um, you know, you see a lot of the white around the, around the yeah. sides mm -hmm. of the eye. A uh, dog that's in a crouch, uh, you know, that's obviously something you want to be cautious of. But again, as I was just saying, you know, crouch to one dog might be perfectly acceptable, such as in a border collie, yep. and in other dogs, it's not acceptable. And here's a here's another good chart. Um, so so basically, the way that I you know look looks like territorial behavior is going to be is that uh, the dog's front paws are a little bit further out, um, maybe at like a 45 degree angle towards their body. They're kind of lowered down into their shoulders a bit more. Um, you know, obviously some dogs are gonna have, are gonna show this type of behavior differently. Like if they're behind a, a fence or behind a cage, then they might actually go out towards the, um, towards the person and, and jump against the cage or jump against the fence or jump against the crate um, to show that type of behavior as well. Um, and there's another, this, this chart that we're looking at here kind of shows some of the different signs that uh, could be associated with territorial or just any type of you know body language from a dog so you can see in a you know territorial dog they're going to be leaned a little bit more forward versus you know a dog that's terrified or stressed out they're gonna their back's going to be hunched over a lot more um you know probably showing signs of trying to get away and it, it's very similar i think to you know human body language where a shy or anxious or or stressed out person is going to be kind of you know pushed away and um and you know turned away from you versus a territorial person or someone that might be a little bit more on the uh, you know type a aggressive side is going to be a lot more you know in your face and and up on you as opposed to um to you know kind of hiding away so i think human behavior matches you know dog behavior pretty relatively well um and so it's just important to kind of note those different signs and it's different in such a way where i'm going to go back to the screen here if you see the this is a similar kind of position to that border collie that had it here uh let's see yeah this border collie so um obviously their their you know front kind of body if you were looking at like a silhouette looks in, in a similar way as ready to as you know trying to play but their the way that their tail is positioned where in this case the tail is down rather than a, in a you know play type situation a tail might be up and wagging and obviously the the dog's whole um, you know, facial expression, their their demeanor. mouth and demeanor, their mouth is closed. Um, definitely a, a completely different behavior and a completely different symptoms than uh, than a dog that's obviously trying to play. 
You know, one of the things I want to mention while Christopher was talking, I took a look here at, uh, at the number of people that have joined us, and it's really cool to have you guys. Um, and I see that when we share it as a, blo as a party to our, um, to our personal pages, that brings in a whole lot more people. So for those of you just uh, tuning in that don't know, uh, every Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock, Mount Standard Time, that's uh, currently 9 o'clock, obviously, Eastern Time, we do a, a little show here. It's about 30, 30 to 45 minutes, and we talk about animal behavior, all things related to animals. Yep. Um, you know, and if you guys have got some, some questions, um, you know, j just uh, shoot them on down to us. Even if we don't get to your question online, we'll take a look at it afterwards and uh, it'll kind of save you some money and you won't have to uh, go hire a trainer to come in. Um, so, yeah, and, and just so you guys know on that note as well, um, we are also on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. So you can listen to us after. You can watch us on YouTube. If you go to heyludwig.com slash the Ostazen Show, or if you go to partnersdogs.com under resources, there's another tab for the Ostazen Show. Um, all of the episodes are, are listed there. It's got the audio. It's got the video as well. Um, so if you guys you know miss any episodes, you're more than welcome to to check it out there. If you follow us on Facebook, then we also post some little clips throughout the week. Um, you know, usually five to, to seven clips throughout the week. You know, quotes from the show, little thirty second snippets, things to kind of you know keep in mind and, and things to uh, to point out that come from the show. Uh, so definitely check it, check those uh, resources out. So let me give you some tips on some of the things you can do to correct uh, resource guarding, and this actually applies to a lot of different things. First thing is. Again, we've talked about this many times. Start with the basic foundation, basic obedience. Do your heel work, sit down, stay, teach your dog to, to listen to you, pay attention. It's kind of like teaching manners. It's the same thing as you know, me teaching my son Christopher or my daughter Alessandra and, and showing them, okay, this is acceptable, that's not acceptable. Uh, this last weekend, we drove up to St. George to take part in a competition up there. Great place, beautiful range. Great crowd of people. And all the way up there, I was busy training Alessandra how to do mental math. And we were practicing compasses. And oh, that's how why to she do... was so much better. Because I was doing it with her the other day. And I was like, oh, pretty good. Yeah, well, it's that time. You know, she's nine. I started Christopher about four when I started teaching him these things. But um, the whole point of teaching them this, you know, teaching her like, I was going to say, teaching her like compass bearings. And, you know, if we're heading north and you turn slightly to your right, where, where does that place us, etc. All those things are just tools. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not going to change her life if she knows what a direction is but it teaches her a foundation of learning and that's the thing you need to do with your dog um, you know teach them to to do a recall for instance that's basically come to you one of the most common issues that people often come to us with is my dog won't come to me well if i want to give the smart ass answer to that it's because and i want to tell people that then it's basically because i say you have no foundation of your dog it's the same as a child that doesn't listen if the mother i gotta be real careful with this I, i've got a great example of a of a client the other day where the kid was just <laughs> can i talk about the snake proofing one um christopher has video of it yeah the mom, he, the mom was super nice she but, was really nice but the child was not happy about the training and actually threw something at christopher yeah. and we have it on video because we often videotape those training sessions uh, one for training purposes for us and and also to document it was it was hysterical looking at this but i was looking at that and i was thinking to myself like you know that that would be a perfect example of where we need to do a little more training and the mother, I think, wants to do it, and, and most parents want to do it. You know, so we're not we're not judging anybody. And yeah. I always tell people, when you bring a dog into training, you know, we're not judging. I could care less what's wrong with your dog. I'm there to help you. We're there to find solutions, etc. So when we talk about finding solutions through basic obedience, I don't want you to ever feel like, oh, we're picking on your dog. I, I got to tell you one example that I just thought about. Now, and he's probably not watching, but I'll make him go watch this later on. Bill Drummond is a buddy of ours in the uh, in the shooting world. He's a phenomenal competitor. He came out of the motor racing and bike racing world. I should say bike racing. And he's, a, he's an absolute A-type freak personality. I mean, I don't know how his family put up with him. He just never stops. Everything is 100 miles an hour. We've traveled all over the world with this guy and everything. Anyway, so one day he calls me up out of the blue. And he says to me, Leighton, I've got a problem with my dog. I'm like, Bill, what's the problem with your dog? And he starts, starts going off about how this dog is territorial. And he's doing this and he's doing that. And I was like, well, we need to do some obedience. He's like, obedience so i'm i'm not gonna make him listen i mean he's my buddy he's he's my friend and i was like well bill let me ask you this where does he sleep well he sleeps on the bed with him and on the couch and on the okay i guess you guys by now are getting the message right there's no way he's going to have a control over his dog if the dog is allowed to pretty much do what he wants so his level of manners that he's got to imprint on the dog needs to improve so teaching him to recall come to you is one of the ways you can test manners it's real easy just take your leash off Call your dog to come. If the dog comes to you, sits in front of you, or sits next to you, you know you have obedience. If yep. they don't, and, that, and that's a good protocol to just to have in general. 
um, you know, for a multitude of reasons, but definitely in, in those types of situations. So I think also a really key thing with territorial type behavior and really any type of reactivity behavior, any type of you know, behavior that's triggered by an increase in their state of arousal, uh, which is essentially like their, their energy, you know, how they're you know, basically showing that either they want something or they don't want something. That's talk about all. that arousal thing because a lot of people when we talk about arousal i watch the instructors all the time they bring up these comments and i'm looking at the client and i'm reading the client and it just goes right over the top of the client's head and i'm like all right go back and explain arousal you, you talk so so arousal is a reaction in the dog so if a dog uh let me give you an example if you're driving down the road again and you see a blue lights come on you know in the car behind you uh, or worse, my favorite example nowadays is if you see an undercover car and all of a sudden these blue lights just light up like crazy. No, I did not get pulled over just for the record. But that that like bumps your adrenaline. You all of a sudden get this rush of adrenaline system. That would be arousal. So yep. for a dog, anything that triggers a reaction, an arousal reaction in the dog is what we refer to as arousal. Yep. So So if you imagine, again, their state of arousal, if in a calm position where you're just hanging out around the house, they're you know maybe chilling on their bed or you're watching TV and they're chilling on the floor next to you, that might be a state of arousal of like one or two or maybe three. Um, if they you know see a, another dog and they're dog aggressive or they see another person come up and they're territorial, then their arousal starts to increase. Maybe it's just a perking up of the ears. Maybe it's they start to look over at it. All of those things start increasing the levels up gradually and gradually. If you try to correct and redirect the behavior when your dog's state of arousal is at a level eight or a level nine, and they're already barking, they're already trying to lunge at the person or, or the uh, or the other dog, and and you try to correct at those times, you're not going to be very effective. And it doesn't matter what you do; you can put an e collar on the dog, you can you know hit the dog. It, it really doesn't matter what you try to do in those situations. You're not going to have any effect. And if anything, you'll probably have an adverse effect where the dog's state of arousal will increase even further because right. now you're just adding adrenaline to the situation. They so become kind of like reactive person, to your, your Yeah, they, they can redirect back onto you where they try to you know bite you maybe. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, my dog would never bite me. But in those situations, their mind is not in their s normal state, uh, uh, state of form. And so it's kind of like if you, you know, have ever been in, in a fight or seen someone in a fight and they had that huge adrenaline rush and they, maybe they just finished the fight, trying to settle them down or try and talk to them when they're in that state of mind is just completely irrelevant and, and it'll be just a waste of time because you're not going to talk them out of that, uh, that state of arousal. So going back, it's important to recognize and then try and stage those increases in the state of arousal so that you can try and address the issue when it's at like a level three or a level four rather than letting get all the way up to level eight and the dog's barking or lunging at someone so it might just be if you're laying on the couch or if you're sitting on the couch and you can see you know the mailman coming up to the door um watching your dog's reaction at that point and waiting for them maybe to just start to perk their ears up and then reinforcing an obedience command or maybe even correcting them at that point in time it all depends on your dog uh, and that's another another great you know command in those situations is like the place command where you're practicing things like impulse control and so forth where if their state of arousal does start to increase you can increase the amount of obedience increase the amount of control and balance out that behavior um, in order to to address that situation yeah we always talk about balance in training right balance in life balance in training same thing um, if you're putting too much pressure on your dog, that'll make your dog a little more subdued. That means you've got to back off on that pressure. If you're allowing your dog to get away with things and they're starting to take advantage, same with children. Uh, sometimes when my daughter is, is hanging out with her friends and she comes home after that, you can kind of see there's a little bit of a difference attitude in her. Um, then I got, I got to, because her drive and her, let's just say her out of control, but more the drive and, and excitement level is higher. Now I've got to raise my control back up again. And then that gets us more into balance. So balance like doing a check, important. just like a, you know, instant, yep. instant check on someone. Um, you know, for a lot of people, if they're say like if you're a sports person and you come off a, a win or you come off a game and you might have had a good game or you might have had a bad game, it doesn't really matter. Um, what matters is your energy level and, and trying to find ways to address that and, and kind of bring it back and, and balance. Did Did you talk about the uh, the toys to reduce anxiety? Because that was a great note that we have here. I, I so didn't. I'll, I'll talk about that just real fast. So, so some of the, there's some awesome tools out there that you can use to reduce anxiety. Now, reducing anxiety, 
for dogs that have territorial issues is often a really good idea. Because remember what we said in the beginning, territorial behavior is often related to insecurity. Insecurity, you need to address by reducing that anxiety in the dog, right? By giving them tools, by training them, as we said a few minutes ago, by doing things with them that are fun, so that it redirects the dog. Instead of, you don't want to beat up on your dog for being anxious, that just makes it worse. You want to basically redirect their anxiety into things that are positive. So you, you create like little tools or little uh, staging exercises that that make the dog more comfortable. Same with people that are nervous to talk in front of a crowd, or nervous so of being forth. in competition. The more you train them, the better they get, et cetera, et cetera. So some of the toys that are out there, and then there's a huge list. Oh my gosh, you just gotta go on Google and you can see. But some of the toys that, uh, that we really like are things where the dog actually triggers something. And if you go to our Facebook page, the partner's Facebook page, uh, Kelly, our general manager and, and head trainer, this afternoon, um, she found a new toy online. She's always finding these things online and buying them for our, for our daycare groups and for our dog parties that we have here at the school. Um, but it's a little toy that when the dog steps on it with his paw, I bought then that, it trick. Oh, you found that? Yeah, I bought oh, that. well, I'm actually, sorry. no, no. So it's one of our is one of our members, uh, one of our team members named Isaac. Uh, who's one of the people in, in daycare, one of our nice. newer um, newer additions to our crew. Uh, so if you guys see him in daycare, definitely say hi and say thank you. It's basically a little stomp pad that triggers a squirt of of water, like a little water fountain that's triggered by a dog stomping on it. Uh, and it's really cool actually because you get to teach, you know, a, a um, uh, a contact point uh so that's another kind of behavior that you can teach to dogs and so, so also, just to explain a contact point is where you teach the dog to to go to a certain spot like a target we yeah. use that in movies a lot uh we use that it's called targeting um the ever dog been goes to sea and world it. and you see like the the zoo um kind of thing where they have all the little animals running around and like picking up a, a bone and then carrying it to a different part right. or right all those things exactly are exactly the same context and in movies we use a lot of as i said targeting to teach an animal to go to a specific point um so in our particular case we use targeting here at the school i forget the name of that uh, that little thing that they control with the remote uh, uh treat and train treat and train so a lot of times we have a, a thing where the dog will walk up when he touches it targets it when he touches it then it feeds him a little treat the purpose of those things is just to train the dog to do things on command right and later on we use that training to control or to uh, manage their behavior whatever behavior they're showing so anyway yeah. so back to this water jet today out of all the dogs that were exposed to this only kelly's dogs understood that they had to touch this to get the little water jet out well that wasn't an accident what happened what's happening is that her dog has had an enormous amount of t uh, training in targeting and in response to that targeting right touch the object get a th get a response and, and i knew something else i wanted to mention as well targeting is also used for handicap assistance dogs so if we want a dog to open a door for somebody or to then the dog is trained if he goes and touches the little touch pad then he gets a reward for that then later on that becomes a trained or behavior pulling. or pull something or pulling a wheelchair if you or, want to teach your dog to to get you a beer out of the fridge that's how yeah. you do it sure that you know i don't know why that always comes up every time we talk to people about training dogs to do stuff. They say, can the dog get me a beer out of the fridge? Yes, they can, but that's not obviously the purpose of the dog. Um, I think we're at the end of all our notes. I just had a quick look through here. Uh, we had a bunch of people tonight. We, we had a pretty good turnout. I really appreciate you guys. Didn't get a lot of questions, so that I assume means you guys' dogs are perfect. Everybody knows well, that they're perfect. we just answered everything perfectly, um, which is but definitely the case. Mary did bring up a really good point here. She said that a lot of people, small dogs use harnesses. Absolutely true, Mary. I was really referring to more the larger breeds or the medium-sized dogs that are dragging. Um, you know, what when we talk about the small dogs, we actually are more concerned about small dogs that are being carried around. And when somebody approaches that dog, the dog reacting to them or biting or something and like America, that uh, i'm sorry amira had a question uh where she said jack is possessive of toys but he's getting a little bit more relaxed with it and is also territorial of certain places and her in the house he watches people and barks at them when they're in his area but he will attack the other dog uh i'm sam which i'm guessing is the other dog in the house if i don't invite him over first so that is probably leaning more to possessive behavior. Or Obviously, resource. Well, so there's resource guarding in there. There's probably territorial behavior and there's probably possessive behavior where um, he's, he's being possessive over you, which I think we'll cover more in depth on another show. Um, but essentially for the resource guarding, we, we covered this uh, once before. You yeah, we mentioned. talked about resource yeah. guarding. So I've got some great video on resource limiting, guarding. Limiting the amount of like ability and, and toys like all toys, all treats, you know, everything to a dog is a privilege. It's a luxury. Um, now, obviously, you do need to feed your dog, so don't not feed your dog. 
but that should make still them earn be, it though. yeah make them earn it so yeah. so yeah. a toy should not be something that they are allowed to to resource guard under any conditions whether it's from you whether it's from another dog that should be corrected that should be redirected and if he doesn't have the capability of handling a toy in certain situations then that shouldn't be a thing that he's allowed to have um and and so forth as well in in the territorial type things all that stuff has to be you know corrected and again not letting him get to that high state of arousal when you try to correct it yeah. um which is is really critical you know when you talk about um you know the dog's natural behavior remember that a lot of these behaviors are actually natural to a dog it's yeah, it's, it's you know it's we, we dog, as humans don't want dogs to do certain yeah. things but it's perfectly normal for a dog to display behavior where they don't want another dog coming in on their space or you know if they have if they're eating something and another dog approaches them you know what we want them to do is to share well that doesn't fit in the animal world so while there are dogs that will do that that's just more of a domesticated dog or a dog that just doesn't care that much of course there are a lot of other dogs that will react towards that yeah i think that's the difference between like what is considered normal versus what is uh, acceptable yeah and of course at the, at the end of it um you know if a dog is eating or, or playing with their food or sorry, eating or playing with a toy and another dog is kind of being a pest, then that, that should be a correction for the other dog as well. It's still not acceptable to, to growl and to resource guard, but at the same time you have to be, you know, kind of aware of, of another dog that might be, be a pest, um, which we see all the time in, in like a daycare setting. So what are we talking about next week? So next week I want to talk about how to choose a dog trainer. Wow. Dang. Which, what if people don't like me? I mean, you know, I have a very soft conscience. Well, I think, I mean, there's always things Ego. that we could imp improve on. Um, really? Of course. Yeah, of course. I don't know. I've, I'm, I'm pretty close to perfect, aren't I? I'm just kidding. Anyway, so that's actually a really good question. It's actually something that, that I wish more people would pay attention to. Um, you know, don't read everything. Don't believe everything you read online because there's a lot of junk online. Um, when it comes to evaluating a good school, evaluating a good trainer, there's some solid questions that you can ask. And, and there's some and, things that... that like I said, you know, we're not perfect. We're definitely there's some Absolutely. things that we can improve on. But even in that same aspect, like we're not the perfect dog trainer for everyone out there. Like we're not trying to be, um, but we're, you know, in some cases, the not the right dog trainer for, for certain people. And that's that's really what it comes down to is a choosing a, a dog trainer. Obviously, you know, we'll get into like those specific points, but also be making sure that it's the right trainer for you, for your style, for how you want to train your dog and for your dog itself. And thanks, Michael. I appreciate everybody liking me. But I know I know there's certain people at USPSA that don't like me, but we won't get into that. But Anyways. Anyway. So all right. next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Uh, the question of the day is, have you ever seen territorial behavior either with your dog or with another dog? And what happened? All right. We will see you guys next Wednesday. Thank you very much for tuning in. Cheers. Take care.